It is the early morning of the 10th of May, 1963. I'm in my home in Tala, lying in the double bed that once belonged to my father, Joseph, and his wife, Elizabeth. Outside, I hear our neighbour, Mrs. Bulger, and my wife, Peg, packing the van with the equipment and food needed for their last day's catering at the spring show in the RDS. I feel tired as I listen to the girls in the kitchen below preparing for school and college. My four girls, Anne, Mary, Margaret and Jacinta. They want to wake me so I can drive them to their various destinations on time. I take them in the black Wolseley car and I drop them off on my way to work in Balls Bridge. It's well known to them all that I have trouble getting out of bed in the early morning, every morning. So they take it in turns to remind me. But they want to let me sleep for as long as they can. I work long hours and mornings are my only time to think and work out the schedules for the day ahead. To be honest, I really like drifting in and out of sleep, snatching the very last minute of rest before setting out on the day's journey. It's great to lie here in bed and imagine I'm casting off for a pollock or a few plaice from the beach at Greystones. I can feel the slightly cool easterly sea breeze on my face as those fish just sit and wait for me 30 yards offshore on a calm day like today. That sensation drifts past as I review the match I refereed in Kilcullen last night. The report I would write later on is memorised in my head, including the fight that broke out in the midfield when I awarded a free kick to the lads in blue when I was told to go and get my specs. Fists flew, of course, before I managed to engineer the climb down without anyone losing face and forced the reconciliatory spit-flying handshakes all round. I am Con. I am 44 years old, born in Dublin in 1918. Really, my full title is Cornelius Eamon de Valera O'Gorman. My father named me after his friend Con, whom he fought alongside in the 4th Battalion Dublin Brigade, Marrowbone Lane, 1916. His friend Con Cornelius Colbert was 25 years old when he was lined up and shot in Kilmainham Jail Yard at dawn on Monday the 8th of May 1916 along with the other condemned patriots. Con had no children when he was killed and neither did my father at that time. Two years later in 1918, when I came along, Joseph, my father, gave me Con Colbert's name along with his heroic history to carry with me for my life. So that there would be no uncertainty about who I was and where I came from, he also attached Eamon de Valera to my title. Perhaps that inclusion was his hope and optimism for the Ireland that would eventually emerge. Drift and sleep. I must tell the girls again about Con Colbert, the hero. They did it, those lads, with just their bikes, their tweed jackets, their fine ideals, and Moggy Kyo's horse and cart full of weapons. Joseph was enough of an inspiration for me. I think of him now and the difficult life he had. Spent and broken from his years of fighting for the freedom of Ireland, he lost his job and his pension as a senior engineer for the part he played in the Rising of 1916. That was hardship indeed. However, having taken up the cause of liberty, he had to continue the struggle. He spent nearly a year imprisoned in Kilmainham, Knutsford and Frongoch, and then on the run from the authorities as the civil war took hold. The toll goes on with the death of his young wife, my mother Molly, when I was five years old, and the loss of our house in Walkinstown, all gone by 1925. But you know, our move to Tala worked out all right for me as a child without a mother. The neighbours looked out for me despite my trickery and my frequent raids on their kitchens. When at last Joseph found a life with Elizabeth, she came and made sense of his disordered life and my nomadic existence in the village.
have to get up now, Daddy, or we will all be late. That'll be Anne, the scholar. Just a few more minutes, I plead, and nod off. I'm really sleepy again and start wondering why I'm so tired this morning. It was just all the usual stuff yesterday. A few short runs to the Curra and a run around the city with Maeve Markovich, daughter of the Countess, while she looked for a gallery to hang her pictures, then off to the match. When the match was finished, sure I was just a short drive away from the Knoll, so I did a quick hop to see my cousin Paddy and his wife Nan for a cup of tea. They live in my mother's home place, and that house and garden is my only link to Molly, my mother. The smell of their garden drifts past me now. Oh no, Nan's flowers for Peg. They're in the back of the car, a great bunch of tulips and lily of the valley. Right. I remember to leave them on the table before I go. You see, I call to the knoll to see them when I can, to try and grab a sense of my mother and imagine her and my grandmother creating this garden of flowers just for me when I need it. Last night we stood together, the three of us, as the evening darkened, becoming silhouettes of ourselves and slowly disappearing. Paddy nods gently at the grandeur of the old black Wolseley, standing upright waiting for the return trip to Tala, and they wave. Sleep and more sleep, and swift steps are back on the stairs again. It's Mary this time. Up, up, now, now, she says bossily, barely putting her head around the door. Yes, yes, I'm up. And to prove it, I reach out for my shoe and bang it on the floor to assure her. I hear her satisfied, mission accomplished sigh as she belts down the stairs two at a time. I give another little tap tap with the left shoe to convince her. That should give me a few more minutes. My concentration is gone now, thinking about the flowers in the back of the car, as I try to work out whether I can squeeze in just another few minutes sleep, because instead of waking I seem to be getting sleepier. It's unusual to feel this tired. I've almost forgotten the spring show, and that I had promised Peg I would drop in during my lunchtime. I'm looking forward to that, as it's always good to see her there, busy, laughing, making sandwiches and pouring tea for the endless queue of people. It's her one week of paid work in the year, helping her neighbour and she loves it. So I'd better get a move on or the whole day will be to loss. My head seems stuck to the pillow. I hear another thump on the stairs. This time it's Jacinta, climbing the stairs as if she's riding a horse over the jumps of badminton. She puts her head around the door, and although she does not want to go to school at all, she encourages me reluctantly to get up with a reminder, you're taking me to Glenless Small on Saturday, that's tomorrow, to get the rabbits, and please remember the horse. It'll be fine in the van, just bring the horse. Of course. It's on the list, I say, and she trots off over the gallops and down to the sunlit rooms below. I know full well that all four of them, besides trying to get me up out of bed, are scrambling madly to get their homework finished at the kitchen table. It's a race against time. The girls have to finish their homework. I have to get up and dressed, go down those stairs, pick up my lunch, my car keys... Put the bikes in the boot because they'll be cycling home. Soon we'll be at Weaver Square, then Golden Bridge, and then finally Anne to attend her secretarial course while she waits for the shout to UCD. But not yet. Just another minute or two while I organise my tiredness into action. What if I can't get out of bed? What will I do then? Just lie here and wait? What will they do? What will I tell them? Look, I'm too tired today. Jump on a bus? But I can't do that now. Remembering the buses are on strike. I'm trying. And now I'm struggling. Although calm, there's an inevitability here this morning that this is beginning to overwhelm me. 
and I'm trying to remember what I was told about that valve years ago when I was sent to the doctor. Think, Con. Think. What did they say to you? Try and remember. Please try and remember what you were told all those years ago. No. I will not believe that this is happening. What will they do? How will they be? How will they live? I need to know this. I can't just let this go. I'm swimming out in the cold of the Atlantic trying to find my fishing line. It's trapped and snagged on the rocks near the shelf at St. John's Point. It cost me five pounds in John Joe McBrady's shop in Kilcar. I have to save it. I plunge in, clothes and all, with a knife, trying to swim down and down until I find the line. Salvaging what I can, I swim back to the surface, grinning as I head for the ledge, lying aloft where the girls are watching and waiting. The waves wash over me and I am safe. So why am I spluttering and spluttering? Not in the water, still in the bed, unable to get up. My breathing is difficult. Margaret is there. Oh, Daddy, please, please, don't do that. It is so frightening. And then, oh no, no. What is happening? Please, Daddy, 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 don't, don't. She's running now back down the stairs. He's dead. He's dead. Quick, quick. I hear them fly up and around the house, running for the doctor down the road to come quickly, to the priest to come and save me. It is too late. I hear them and I know that it is the end. I had been warned about that valve. But when you love your life, this is not something you want to believe can ever, ever happen. So that Friday morning on the 10th of May, 56 years ago, I left our four girls and Peg to find their way without me. It was, as I was told, very quick and over in a flash. But you can't quit your life in an instant. What have I left for them to remember? Have I left anything? Anything nearly enough for a few drips of memory to linger through their lifetime. Perhaps, hopefully, maybe the love I have for each of them will transcend all else. That mountain of love that is in here inside me. Please go, go now to them. Help them find me when they need me. Carry them up mountains, beyond mountains, without fear or trepidation. Keep them safe and secure to see the world and know its grandeur. Surround them so they can relish the wonder of their surroundings wherever they are. Know the beauty of our country and help them face the challenges that they will face with confidence and good humour. Knowing that they had my whole short life and a world of love. Thank you.